one of the, the most famous classical composers in all of history is Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach grew up in a town in Germany beneath the Wartburg Castle. And that's, that's the castle when, after the Diet of Worms, when Luther made his big statement, his friends kidnapped him and took him to the castle to hide him from those who would kill him. And while he was there, Luther translated the Bible into German for the people to read. Well, not surprisingly, Bach was fine, very fond of Luther and fond of theology. In fact, they say that, that Bach's library, he had over 80 theological books. For a man in the 1700s to have 80 theological books is amazing. And of course, they found his Luther translation of the Bible there. His, his faith also fills his musical compositions. Many of Bach's compositions were written for the church to sing and were about Christ. At the top, of every one of his, comp maybe not everyone, but most of his compositions are the letters J, J, which is Latin for Jesu Juva, which means Jesus help. And at the end of every composition that he wrote, we find the letters S, D, G, Soli Deo Gloria, all glory to God alone. You see, Bach knew that his musical compositions would only be worth writing if Jesus helped him write them, and at the end of them, he gave all the glory to God. W would that we had more artists like Bach in the world. Uh, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to join Bach in Soli Deo Gloria, giving glory to God alone. Soli Deo Gloria, you might recall, is the fifth of those Reformation solas that we're looking at. Those solas, you might recall, are the, the core doctrines that shaped the movement of the Reformation, and they also remain really at the core of our 21st century Baptist faith today. And we've already looked at four of these solas. We looked at sola scriptura. The Bible alone is our authority in all matters of faith and practice. In sola scriptura, God the author gets all the glory. Sola Dea Gloria. In front of the Sola Scriptura, we learn about salvation. We learn that it is Solus Christus, that it is in Christ alone, only by the person and work of Christ is anyone ever saved from the wrath of God against sinners. So in other words, Christ gets all the glory alone for the work of salvation. And that shows also in sola gratia, that salvation is by grace alone, and sola fide, that it is received by faith alone. If it is by grace, and it is through faith, then it is not of ourselves. Therefore, all the glory goes to God alone. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be all the glory and honor and worship, is the natural fifth sola. It's the one that flows from all of the others. And just like we did last week, we're going to turn to the book of Romans to help us understand, embrace, and live in light of the truth that, that all of life is to be lived solely Deo Gloria. Now, we're going to be in Romans chapter 11 this morning, and we want to set the context for that so we can understand where we are. To help us with that, you need to look at, at Romans 9 through 11. That's, that's a very succinct section in the book of Romans, and it's, it's really dealing with, Paul is dealing with, in those three chapters, the problem of Old Testament Israel and a new covenant people of God justified by faith that includes Gentiles. He's really answering the question, if God lets Gentiles come into his kingdom by faith in Christ, does that mean he's given up on Israel with all of their, their laws and their, their, their religion? Is Israel chronologically left behind? Is the question Paul addresses in Romans 9 through 11. He wrestles with that and he finds hope for both the Gentiles and Israel in the doctrine of election. And then in chapter 11, verses 11 to 24, he explains how this all works out with this great picture of an olive tree. It's a picture of an olive tree. And at the root of that tree is Christ. Christ is the root. And the people of God grow up out of that root, which is Christ. Now, there were branches on that tree. And those branches that were the natural branches of that tree were the people of Israel. 
But because they lacked faith, those branches were broken off and cast aside. There were some wild branches growing over here that were the Gentiles, and by faith, they have been grafted in. But good news, good news for Israel, is those ones that were broken off and cast aside don't have to forever be broken off and cast aside. They too can be regrafted in by faith. Paul even says, grafting in the Gentiles is partly so that the Jews would be jealous and come by faith to Christ too. Great picture that he paints of that tree. And then that brings us to where we're going to be this morning. In Romans 11, verses 33 to 36. You know, when Paul started to think about Israel in chapter 9 and how they had been broken off because of unbelief, his heart was broken. He even asked God to condemn him to hell if that would save his people Israel. I mean... That's radical words to be putting down in paper and thinking about regarding your salvation. Well, now as he gets to, to verses 33 to 36, he breaks out in praise to God because he understands there is hope for Israel and it is through faith in Jesus Christ. And as Paul looks back at how God determined to save both Jew and Gentile sinners by grace through faith because of and in Christ... He looks back at this great act of God. Paul breaks into praise and he has a little bit of a soli deo gloria moment. Glory to God alone for this. And that's what we want to see in this passage. Because here in, in this passage, Romans 11, 33 to 36, Paul makes a threefold proclamation of glory to God alone. I'm going to ask if you're able, you'd stand in honor of God's word once more as we read this passage. Paul writes this. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him... And through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we add our amen to Paul's. <clears throat> May you receive all the glory. Certainly, Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to see that, that. That as we think of our salvation, you and you alone deserve all the glory. As we think of every blessing we have ever received or experienced in this life, you and you alone receive all the glory. Make that truth clear to our minds this morning. Write it on our hearts. Give us faith to believe it. And Lord, help it to shape the way we live every moment of our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. As I said, these verses, Paul makes a really a threefold proclamation of glory to God alone. And he first says this, glory must be to God alone because of who he is and what he has done. Simply because of who God is and what God has done, God deserves all the glory. Verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. Paul's praise focuses first on the glory God deserves because who he is, and then it moves to the glory God deserves because of what he's done. First of all, God deserves glory for the depth of his riches. God has more than enough of everything he needs to be God. He has more than enough grace to save everyone who would come to him in faith. God will never run out of grace. He has a depth of riches of grace. God also has a wealth of resources from which he can provide whatever a man may need. If God desires to bless someone, God is never out of stuff to bless with. The depth of his riches, the wealth of his resources. God also has a wealth of righteousness, which can be accounted to a sinner who turns to Christ. God is not lacking in anything good. We should praise God for the depth of his riches. Give glory to God for the depth of his riches. 
but God also deserves glory for the depth of his wisdom. The wisdom of God is not lacking. God's wisdom refers to the skillful way in which he has woven together all of the events of time in order to accomplish his divine plan for saving sinners and transforming them into the church. Think about that. The wisdom of God in, in the way he just knit it all together to bring about the salvation of sinners. It can be seen in the way he used the Old Testament covenants to reveal man's great need for a perfect prophet, priest, and king who would save them and rule them in righteousness. But it can also be seen in how he sent his son, Paul says, at just the right time to accomplish salvation and be that prophet, priest, and king. To open that door for a new covenant for sinners to come through faith. So we should give all the glory to God for the depth of his wisdom as is worked out in all of time and space that sinners might be saved. And also God deserves all the glory for the depth of his knowledge. The depth of the knowledge of God. God's understanding of what is true and good and right is never exhausted. There is nothing true and good and right unknown by God. And his understanding of these things, it, it cannot be fathomed. Think about it. He is the one who set the earth and the heavens in place and filled them and formed them such that it works out, such that, that life can exist on this planet, such, such that, that men and women can have children and we can fill the planet. I mean, he worked it all out. His knowledge then of what he created cannot be equaled. He was the one who made it. The one who breathed life into man. Gave him an eternal soul. And provided for the redemption of his fallen nature. And then eventually the glorification of his body. Who knows man better than the one who did that? Glory be to God for the depth of his knowledge as Creator, Redeemer, and Lord. So first of all, we see we have to give glory to God and God alone for these things, because no one else can we say that of. Glory to God, honor to God, worship to God for His glorious character, for who He is. But that's not all. We need to give all the glory to God because of what He's done for His works. Paul moves on and he says that we should give glory to God for the unsearchable nature of His judgments. God's judgments are his decrees. You think about a judge who makes that final statement of the verdict, right? God makes decrees. He said, this is the way it is. This is the way it will be. We simply cannot grasp his decrees of what is right and wrong and what will be because we will never meet in our lifetime a person who gets it right all the time. Debbie might ask, no, just kidding. She knows that she's never met anyone like that, right? But God, God does. God has never called wrong right or right wrong. Never. Not once. God has never said something will come to pass that does not or will not eventually come to pass. God has never spoken truth and it turned out to be error. His judgments or decrees are true at a level deeper than anything we will experience this side of glory till the day when we are resurrected, glorified, and made to dwell in His perfect and true presence. So glory be to God for all of His judgments. His decrees are truer than anything we can search out or ever find or comprehend from our experiences. And glory be to God for the unsearchable nature of His ways. It's not only his words, his decrees that have earned him the right to receive all of our glory. It's his ways. It's what he does. His works deserve praise and glory. God's sovereign and providential control of salvation history is beyond human understanding. The way he has worked in time and space through Israel and the prophets and the priests and then through the the work of Christ, and then the work of the, the apostles. We must believe and trust in the exchange of the righteousness 
of Christ for our sins and the exchange of his suffering as a substitute for the wrath we deserved. But how many of you can explain how God does that? How does God actually transfer the righteousness of Christ to a sinful man and the sins of a man to Christ on the cross? How did he do that? His ways are unsearchable. When Paul writes that God made him sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, who can explain the metaphysics there? All believers trust in the fact that Christ rose from the grave. And we are absolutely depending on the fact that we will follow suit one day, aren't we? That we will rise from the grave. How? Who understands how, how God breathes life into dead people and gives them glorified bodies that will live in eternity in His presence? His ways are unsearchable and they're all good. So glory be to God for His unsearchable ways. God and only God knows His ways and always accomplishes His good purposes. Glory must be to God alone because of who He is and because of what He has done. Because of what He's done. There is no field of endeavor in which any man can ever claim such glory. Consider this. When Hall of Fame wide receiver... Lynn Swan was catching 336 passes for the Steelers, you might have been tempted to give glory to him and him alone for those acrobatic catches. And certainly it was those soft hands catching the ball, his speed and his moves to get open to where he could catch it that had something to do with it, but to give him all the glory for those passes would be wrong. He had a mother who encouraged him to go someplace and play football where he could develop his skills. His father attended every game. His coaches taught him the game, and then Mr. Rooney finally gave him a contract where he could play it on the big stage. In fact, at his Hall of Fame introduction, Lynn Swan said, I am not here because I was that good. I'm here because of the people around me who made me that good. The very best men and women in their fields all stand on the shoulders of others. God needs no one's shoulders to stand on for his person or his works. Not so with God. He is the self-glorious one who alone does only glorious deeds, says only glorious things, and is only in himself always glorious. His deeds are beyond our comprehension in their greatness and goodness. So solely Deo glory. Glory to God alone. Glory must be to God alone because of who He is and what He's done. But we also see here that glory must be to God alone because man is nothing in comparison. Because man is nothing in comparison. Verses 34 and 35. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Paul asks really three questions here that are intended to help us recognize that, that God deserves all the glory because no other created being deserves any of it. Especially not us. Paul's referring, referencing two Old Testament passages. The, the first two questions come from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 13. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has known the mind of the Lord? If, if, if God were to take a written exam on the nature of all created matter, and we gave that same exam to Albert Einstein, you tell me who's going to get the higher score. Right? The, the one who designed it, or the one who spent all his life and never quite finished trying to understand what he designed. Right? No one has ever known the mind of the Lord. Einstein himself said, I have no special talent. I am only passionately curious. He, he wanted to know, wanted to understand. We can pursue greater understanding of the created universe. Indeed, God created us, created us with curious minds like Einstein so that we would pursue understanding of things. But at the end of the day, and several times during each day, we run into things we don't understand. God never does. 
like Habakkuk in the book named after him. Habakkuk wondered, how will God deal with his rebellious people? And God's answer was, I'll send the Chaldeans to conquer them. And Habakkuk said, how could you use wicked Chaldeans to come and conquer us? How's that any better? And God says, because I'm going to punish them too. We, we must understand that God deserves all the glory because we've got nothing to offer him in the realm of knowledge. God never will come to any of us and say, I don't quite understand this. Could you help me? So we've got to give all glory to God because we understand that we don't deserve it. And then Paul asks a second question. Who has been the Lord's counselor? Who has the Lord ever turned to when he needed advice figuring out what to do? Now, I've read through the whole Bible, and I'm sure many of you have read through the whole Bible, and I cannot recall a single instance. You know why God never sought counsel? Because you don't need to seek advice from someone less wise than you are. Thus, nobody's ever had to clear time off their schedule to counsel God. And that's a good thing, too. I mean, hey, you're getting advice this week, aren't you? Think of all the people out there giving you advice on how to vote, who to vote for. Right? You can't breathe without running into it. Being a swing state is not easy. Think of that. Think of all the people. Now, which one of them would you want God to seek advice from on how to save and preserve your soul? I'm going none. Right? And these are the people that we're going to put in the places where we need wise people. But none of them could ever counsel God. God has never had to seek the counsel of men, because remember what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. If you take the bottom of God's wisdom and, and strength, at the very bottom of it, man doesn't hit the bottom of it. Never gets there. Man does not deserve any of the glory. And then Paul references Job 41.11 when he asks his third question, Who has given a gift to the Lord that he might be repaid? Who's had to provide for the Lord because the Lord was lacking? Where, where you could say, Lord, I, I've got that. I'll cover you. Can you imagine worshiping a God who needs you to make lunch for him? Yet that's what many people around the world do is they offer food to idols. They worship a God that they think needs lunch. Can you imagine worshiping a God who would need your money in order to save sinners? Yet that's what some TV preachers claim. Give me 50 bucks, I can save 10 souls. I've heard it. Friends, we need help. I don't know about you, but I can list and learn out of paper the times I needed help yesterday. We need help because we lack God never needs help. He never needs you to cover for him. We, we borrow money to buy houses and cars. We ask each other for help when things need to be fixed around the house. We go to doctors for help when we're sick. We need help. God never needs the help of man. All glory goes to God. Glory must be to God's alone simply because man is nothing in comparison. And remember, man is the highest created being on the planet. God never looks to us to provide for him, be it knowledge, wisdom, or provision. In comparison to God, we know nothing, understand how to accomplish nothing, and don't have the wherewithal to accomplish it even if we did. If life was graded on a curve and God was in my class, I would fail everything. Friends, in church life, we all can talk about the need to be humble in our relationships with one another. I think what we have right here in Romans chapter 11 is, is, is the core solution to our problem being humble in our relationships with each other. If we cannot start with this, I need to be incredibly humble before a God who doesn't need me. I'll never be humble in relationships with other people. If I don't understand that I've got nothing to offer to God, I'll never get to the point to understand that, that the world doesn't need me either. Humility comes first when we understand that we need humility before God. And that comes when we dwell on the person and acts of God 
those in his word and in our experience, when we consider our own acts in comparison and see how woefully inadequate we are, and when we bow and praise God, give him glory alone. So glory must be to God alone because of who he is and what he's done. And because man is nothing in comparison with God. And glory must be to God alone because of his sovereignty or his rule over history. His sovereignty or his rule over history. Verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Paul wraps up this Romans 11 solo deo gloria doxology with three declarations regarding the rule of God over all the events of time, especially those of salvation. And he starts from him. From him are all things. God is to be glorified alone because God is the source of all things. Where does everything begin? Everything begins in the mind of God. Everything begins in the mind of God and God speaks. You know Genesis 1, right? God says, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made exactly that. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it appeared. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruits bearing fruit, uh, which is in their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night. Let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. And let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to light, to give light upon the earth. And there was light. He said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of heavens. Fish and birds, they were there. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And he described them and it was so. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God determined it in his mind. God spoke it and it was so. From him are all things. In John 1, John wrote of Christ. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Everything that exists, exists because our triune God thought of it and made it. He is the source of all things. But not only that, through him are all things. Through him are all things. God is to be glorified because he is the mover of all things. As time passes, things happen, leading to other things. Leading to other things. And God rules over all the causes, all the decisions, the actions and events in the process of time. It has to be that way. Think about this. You've got Genesis 1 in your Bible. And you have Revelation, the book that says when it's all done in your Bible. God wrote the beginning as God the creator. God has written the end as God the redeemer. That means God had to write everything that got the beginning to the end. Otherwise, it doesn't land there, right? If you decided to bake an apple pie, and I'm kind of praying someone did, <laughs> you did not just gather together apples, butter, flour, eggs, brown sugar, white sugar, cinnamon, and nutmeg in the beginning and depend on fate to produce a pie, right? You mix just the right ingredients in just the right proportions to make a crust and you rolled it out. Or you bought one, but we'll pretend you made one. Maybe you pre-baked the bottom crust and got it just right before you mixed all the stuff that make the filling and you put it in that crust and you covered it with the other crust maybe and, and, and then you bake the pie at just the right temperature for just the right amount of time. And even then you know you might not have been perfect and this might not turn out to be the perfect pie. But you knew you had to follow every one of those steps to get from the beginning of stuff on the counter to pie on the counter. 
When God created man with free will, knowing full well that he would fall into sin and his descendants would follow suit, God did not just stand by and hope that somehow they reached that point where every tribe, tongue, people, and nation is gathered around the throne of God, praising him forever and ever with all the living creatures. Right? God didn't just hope it would work out. The God who determined the ends has been at work every second throughout history, working out the means to accomplish those ends. God did not just set things up at the beginning, decide where they'd end, and say, hope it gets there. He is the mover of all things. It's all through Him. So it is from Him and through Him, but here's where we really hit the solidary glory. It is all to Him. It is all to Him. To Him are all things. He is the destination of history. God did not just determine the end of things. Think about, how would I like this to work out? Right? God was not up there saying, well, I've got people, i got a planet, I made all that. What do I want that to look? What do I want this? Maybe we'll create a heaven or a kingdom on earth. Maybe we'll do all these wonderful things. God did not do that because God is God. The only right end for history is everything gathered around the throne saying, holy, 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 praise the Lamb. The only right end for the passage of time is that it gets back to God, the glorified one, with all of his creatures perfectly glorifying him. That means the ultimate destiny of all things must be in relation to God. His perfect plan must come to pass and bring Him glory. He's got to be glorified in that. Everything that happens is working its way toward an end which will result in the greatest glory going to the God who started it and drove it to its fruition. Glory must be to God alone because of God's threefold rule or sovereignty over history. All things flow from the creative mind and will of God. They advance through history, through His wisdom and work in time and space, and they will terminate in a grand display of His holiness and His glory. Next time you read Genesis, read it with Revelation in mind. And the next time you read Revelation, read it with Genesis in mind, and then realize all that stuff in the middle was God getting it from here to there. It was God. Think about this. Think about how God had to explain it to Job. And you know the story of Job, right? Job has everything go bad. I mean, just absolutely everything goes wrong for Job. Disease, loss of family, loss of stuff, nagging wife. He's got everything going wrong for him. Right? And Job's friends come to comfort him in his suffering. And they have this incredibly long conversation where the friends say, well, this must be God doing this. And Job says, no, it isn't. God owes me an explanation. That's a summary of a very long discussion. But they say, God, God's punishing you for something. Job, you must have done something wrong. And Job says, I didn't do anything wrong. If I did anything wrong, God owes me my day in court. Essentially is what Job is saying. But when Job is sitting there thinking God owes him an explanation, God comes and he gives an answer to Job. God asked Job, he says, Job, where were you when I created the heavens and earth? This is my summary. I'm not going to read the whole book of Job to you. Where were you when I created the heavens and earth? That's a good question. And he says, Job, what contribution did you make to me sustaining the earth and keeping things going and keeping things together? And then he says, Job, let me ask, do you actually understand everything I've ever made? Do you have full knowledge of all this stuff? Job, where, where does wisdom come from? Where does wisdom come from? And it goes on and on. God's answer to Job is, is relatively long, but God gets it all said in a whole lot less chapters than Job's friends get it said. But God says, Job, who are you? Where were you when I was doing everything that really mattered? God's point to Job in the time of Job's suffering was simple. Job, you don't need to understand. You just need to give glory to God. You don't need to understand. You just need to trust and give glory to God. Friends, is that not a message that many of us need to hear 
many times almost every day. How many times do you say, I just don't understand? I mean, almost every time I watch the news, I just don't understand. When I think about people that I love who are dealing with sickness, disease, or loss, uh, family problems, and I think, you know, I just don't understand. And, and God is going to come and God is going to say to you this. He's going to say, you don't need to understand. You need to trust me and give glory to me. And Job does, Job gets that. You don't want to leave you hanging. Job gets that. Job gives glory to God and God restores Job. And it is beautiful. It is wonderful. But we need to understand that the ultimate goal of our life is glory to God. Glory to God in all things. Because they are all from Him. They are all through Him. And they are all to Him. So we must give glory to God. Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone is because of who He is and what He's done. Because we are nothing in comparison to Him and because of His sovereign rule over all of history. Now Paul concludes his doxology with that basic summary. To Him be glory forever. Amen. And there is one more point I think we could make out of that. You may as well give Him glory now. Because you are going to give him glory forever. Just let it be practice. Now, the fact is that you're going to give him glory forever in one of two places. Those who, 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 who will refuse the gift of his son, refuse the gift of salvation in Christ, will be giving glory to God through their suffering for all eternity. Their suffering will be a testimony that God was righteous and good and cannot tolerate sin for all eternity. Their suffering will glorify God. But those who trust in Jesus, those who believe that what Jesus did on the cross paid the price for their sins, that when Jesus rose up out of the grave on the third day, it's because the price was paid in full and there is now a way for them to be right with God. Those who trust in that and that alone, that salvation is in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, those who trust in that will give glory to God throughout eternity, joining with the living creatures and the elders and the cherubim and all those creatures in heaven throughout eternity. And a new heavens and new out throughout eternity glorifying God. Now my prayer is this morning, you know that you will be in the latter group, not the former group. That's my prayer this morning. But I also want to say, if you don't know, today is the day to do something about that. Today is the day to trust that the God who is the God who we just read about, really sent His Son, that His Son accomplished the salvation that we've been talking about for weeks. Today is the day to believe that that is true for you. Receive that gift of that salvation and know that you will have a wonderful time for all eternity giving glory to a God who deserves it. Please, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today and be saved if you have not been before today. Do that. And, and don't keep quiet about that. We've just been looking at a whole passage. It's all about giving glory to God. If the Almighty God has saved you, you've got to give glory to God. Out loud. To other people. Some of them who get it, some of them who don't. Give glory to God. And I, I pray that Paul's reasons why you should give glory to, to God for your salvation and every good thing have convinced you. I mean, they're divinely inspired reasons. They, they certainly should have. Now, maybe they're convincing, you're convinced I should give glory to God and you're wondering how? How can you give more glory to God? How can you do it in all things? I want to offer you just a couple of examples as we kind of wrap up this morning, ways you can give more glory to God. First of all, it's, it's the old hymn, but it's a good one. Count your blessings. And give God the credit out loud. I, I still remember those, those old hymn leaders, we'd sing count your blessings. They'd stop in the middle and said, it said count your blessings. I need to hear some blessings. And until he got like five testimonies, he wouldn't move to the next verse. But he has a good point. We need to give glory to God counting our blessings. John Piper 
once described how to drink orange juice to the glory of God. He said this, I will affirm joyfully from the word of God the color yellow is a gift from God. The sweet taste is a gift from God. The nourishment and the way my body uses it is a gift from God. The sun and the rain that grew the oranges is a gift from God. The trucking and grocery chain that brought it to me is a gift of God. And the list could go on and on. I will gladfully, joyfully say that out loud I will feel that. I will give glory to God for orange juice. I think we need to start getting a little more detailed in giving our glory to God. So second, first, count your blessings. Second, pray out loud. And when you do, be sure to thank God for everything you experience as a blessing. Yes, you don't have to mouth the words out loud to pray out loud. But why wouldn't you? Why do we want to pray in secret so often? If we're called to give glory to God. Why would our prayers of thanksgiving be quiet? So I want to encourage you, pray out loud, give glory to God, give Him thanks out loud. Do it that others may hear you giving glory to God. Third, so count your blessings, pray out loud and give thanks. Third, remind yourself often that you don't deserve the good things you receive in place of what you deserve, which is suffering in hell. That when you have good things, you don't deserve them. Because we live in an incredibly materialistic world that says, I deserve my fair share. Fill in the blank, right? I deserve my fair share of stuff, vacations, happy families, money. I deserve my fair share. Like I said, it's election season. Everybody's appealing to your sense that you think you deserve your fair share. You don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything. Because I'm a rebel against a holy God. He saved me. I didn't deserve that. He has given me good gifts, a good wife, a good home, a good church. All blessings that I don't deserve. So give glory to God by reminding yourself that you don't deserve all these good things he has given you. And then finally, dwell a little more on the glories of what God has made. Let the nerdy wonders of science or just the beauty of a single flower make you give glory to God for making that. I, 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 this creation is beautiful and wonderful. There, there, there is so much that is so amazing. I mean, if you ever watch any of those sciencey shows and they talk about how this gets together, now they're going to throw in evolution and stuff because they don't know where to give the glory. You realize that's what it is, right? If I don't know where to give the glory, I'm just going to pretend nobody gets it. That's silly. It's just silly. We know better, so we learn all those sciencey stuff and we go, glory to God. He did that, He made DNA. I don't even understand DNA, other than it looks, you know, kind of squiggly. But God made it, and it works, right? I mean, if you look like your mom and dad, God did that, right? So dwell a little more on the glories of his creation and give glory to God for that. And those are just a few of the things you can do. There's so many things. Give, give things away like you believe that God blessed you in order that you might give things away and give glory to God as you give things away. I mean, give them away and say, hey, glory to God, he gave it to me so I could give it to you. Give glory to God. The list could go on and on. Make sure your life is lived for the glory of God. For Paul makes it clear in the first chapter of Romans, there is not much you could do that is worse than this, to know God but not honor him as God and give thanks to him. Don't be that person. Give glory to God. We'll just close with Paul's words. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as I come before you right now, I recognize that the words I have to offer you are not good enough. I realize that even as I, I preached your word, I didn't do it good enough because you deserve 
perfection. You deserve glory in all things. But God, I pray this morning that your spirit would use this word that you inspired and would write it on our minds that it might be clear that indeed you are the one who deserves all glory. I pray that you would give us faith in our hearts that we would truly believe this. And I pray that you would give us the courage to live like it, giving you glory for all things. For you alone are worthy. Lord, I pray this morning that if there's, there's one here who has, has never lived that kind of life, never trusted in what Jesus has done for them, such that they see you as this great Savior now and, and can give you glory, I pray that today you would work in their hearts, that you would change their minds, change their hearts, and save them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.